We are living through a digital revolution. A super connected world in which technology engulfs every aspect of our lives. Since the end of the Second World War, humanity has been on a relentless pursuit of innovation and technological progress. The proportion of people living in extreme poverty has dropped from almost three quarters in 1950 to less than an eighth today. Of course, this rapid advancement doesn't just come out of nowhere. And one of the key drivers was the microprocessor. The ability to shrink an entire computer to a chip the size of a finger has allowed for the mass adoption of both home and mobile computers. They have also had far reaching implications, helping to advance every industry from manufacturing, finance, retail to healthcare. The last 75 years has seen computer technology grow at a truly incredible rate. We're going to look at the complete journey from early vacuum tube machines to the birth of home computers. From the multimedia madness of the 1990s to the multi-core mindset of the 2000s and 2010s. And finally, what is ahead? To understand how all this came about, you need to go back to the very beginning of digital electronics and look at how early post-war computers were designed. In 1945, with Allied victory imminent, it could have easily been assumed that the military use of computer technology would subside, leaving the endeavour to have a purely academic role. However, the slow emergence of the bitter rivalry between the Soviet Union and the United States meant that this was far from the case. Indeed, the first digital computer, the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, or ENIAC for short, was used by the United States Army for calculating firing tables for artillery, and later for research into the hydrogen bomb. Outperforming mechanical computers by a factor of a thousand, ENIAC was a revolution in computer technology. Press articles at the time reference how it could vastly outperform existing computers. The US Army was so proud of it, they even used it in their own recruitment advertisements. Overall, it was met with a huge critical acclaim, despite being challenging to program for. The inventors of ENIAC, John Morkley and John Eckert, proposed a successor shortly after called EDVAC, or Electronic Discrete Variable Automatic Computer. Unlike ENIAC, which used a decimal representation for numbers, EDVAC used a binary representation, making data storage much more compact. Morkley and Eckert were joined by British mathematician John von Neumann, who wrote an influential report on the EDVAC, detailing how the computer could be extended by storing the programs alongside the data, rather than having the two in separate parts of memory. This idea would be known as the von Neumann architecture, which virtually every microprocessor has since been built on. Britain's loss of superpower status in the early 20th century meant that its efforts were far more research focused than in America. The Manchester Baby, developed a couple of years after ENIAC, was the first computer to be equipped with random access memory meaning it could store programs alongside data. This was achieved by using a modified set of four Williams CV1131 CRT monitors. The baby was slow, even for the time, but its use of random access memory was pioneering, and it would lay the groundwork for the Ferranti Mark I, the world's first commercially available computer. During development of the baby, 
Another computer, called the EDSAC, was being developed at the University of Cambridge. The EDSAC hardware was not as technologically advanced as the baby, featuring only serial memory, but nonetheless correctly implemented the von Neumann architecture and had a far more advanced instruction set. Featuring 14 instructions compared to the baby 7, it allowed for easier software development, particularly later in its life. One such example was OXO, an implementation of Tic-Tac-Toe, which is widely considered to be the first video game ever created. It was becoming increasingly clear that the scientific and commercial applications of computers would far outstrip the military use of the mid to late 1940s. By 1954, 95% of computers were used for non-military purposes. Despite their increased use, there were still limitations preventing wider adoption of computers. The defining characteristic for all these early machines was the use of vacuum tubes, or valves, for their main processing elements. Vacuum tubes were unreliable, hot, power hungry, and heavy. Even a small computer like the Manchester Baby weighed in excess of a ton. The solution was the transistor. The first transistor was manufactured at the Great Bell Labs in 1947. It performed the same job as a vacuum tube, but could be smaller, more reliable, and less power hungry due to its lack of an electron beam. The first computer to use these was the Manchester Transistor Computer the great-grandson of the Manchester Baby. It used 250 transistors, consumed only 150 watts of power, and in the shadow of vacuum tube domination, seemed like a miracle. There was a problem, however. These early transistors were simply too difficult to mass-produce and scale, limiting their potential. There were attempts to rectify this problem, using electric fields to control the current, compared to the more traditional method of a direct terminal. This proved difficult though, and little success was made over several years. This was until engineer Mohamed Atala proposed to cover the silicon wafer with a thin layer of silicon dioxide, which allowed the electric field to more easily pass through the silicon. This process led to the creation of the Metal Oxide Silicon Field Effect Transistor, or MOSFET, in 1959, a transistor with high manufacturability and extremely low power cost. MOSFETs made it possible to develop high-density integrated circuits, which allowed for cheaper and smaller systems, thus drastically increasing adoption numbers. Early MOSFET machines, such as the IBM System 360 family, used a hybrid interconnect circuit approach, combining integrated circuits with traditional electronic components. The System 360 was particularly influential due to IBM's decision to separate the system architecture from the implementation. This meant that all computers in the family, from the cheap Model 30 to the expensive Model 75, could run the same software, a concept that would become widely accepted in the industry. Its successor, the System 370, made full use of monolithic integrated circuits. The adoption of these integrated circuits created a new type of computer entirely, the mini computer. These systems were scaled-down versions of large mainframe computers, designed to provide computing power to organisations who wanted to use computers, but couldn't afford or justify a large mainframe. Largely accepted as the first commercial mini-computer, the DEC PDP-5 was one-fifth the price and one-quarter the weight of the PDP-1 released four years earlier. It was less powerful, featuring only 12-bit memory 
compared to the 18-bit larger PDP machines, but it was hugely successful, selling more than 1,000 units. This entry point was continually lowered throughout the early 70s, allowing even more widespread adoption. The Data General Nova, with its 200kHz clock speed and 8K of RAM, cost just $8,000 and was one of the most popular minicomputers of the decade. Some, however, knew that the idea of miniaturization could be taken to even more extremes. The first use of a microprocessor was in the F-14 Tomcat fighter jet and was developed by Garrett AI Research. The company was asked by the US Navy to build a flight computer that could compete with the electromechanical system that was being used during development. The processor created to do this took up 120th the space of the existing system and was much more reliable. Impressed by its capabilities, the Navy used this chip in all early F-14s, but all information regarding its development was classified until 1997, so its effects on the wider industry are little, if any. The story of the first commercial microprocessor involved Japanese company Buzzacom, who were developing a range of programmable calculators, but were struggling to produce the chips that required. The company contacted Intel, who were large producers of computer memory for mainframe and minicomputers, and asked whether they could produce a 7-chip design for their calculator. Intel accepted, and project engineer Ted Hoff proposed that this could be reduced to 4 chips to lower costs. Hoff, not being a chip designer, moved on to other projects, and was succeeded by Italian engineer Federico Fagin whom Intel had hired from Fairchild Semiconductor. While working at Fairchild, Fagin invented a new transistor technology called a self-aligned gate. This allows for the gate of the transistor to have a much smaller overlap with the source and drain regions by automatically generating it within the mask process. Removing the spot on neck and transistor design meant that performance could easily be increased when moving to a smaller lithography. Fairchild were reluctant to adopt this technology, so when Fajin moved to Intel, he immediately put it to use in the Buzzacom project. This led to the creation of the Intel 4004, which was delivered to Buzzacom in 1971. The company would go on to sell more than 100,000 4004 powered calculators. The world's first commercial microprocessor was born, and a new era of computing was about to begin.